Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this Heart Foundation webcast on the new heart failure guidelines from the Heart Foundation and the Cardiac Society of Australia and New Zealand. This is the 2018 guidelines. Before I go on, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. That's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, because we're coming to you from downtown Sydney. Um, and the people speaking tonight were on the guidelines writing group. Ralph Odem is a full-time GP and is uh, also at the University of Melbourne and Secretary of the GP section, the Australian Medical Association. Don't hold that against him. John Atherton is a cardiologist and a chair of the, of the heart failure, new heart failure guidelines and is director of cardiology at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital and also works and is also at the University of Queensland. And last but not least is Ingrid Hopper, Hopper who's a general physician and a clinical pharmacologist, heavily involved in registries and clinical epidemiology at Monash University and the Alfred Hospital. So this is our panel. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and uh, Ralph, you're going to set the scene here with the guidelines. Yes. So we're here talking about these wonderful new, this wonderful new sort of prac, which actually, is Actually, just, just yep. before you go on, sorry yes. to interrupt you. I forgot to tell you that it's actually important that you uh, send in your questions or comments whenever you want. Um, so we'll load them up and I may bring them into the conversation even before the presentations are finished. Now, you can do that in three ways. One is press the button on the bottom side of your bottom right-hand corner of your screen. The other is you can actually tweet. Do you remember that? Get your 14-year-old 14 14 year child and they'll teach you how to do it. Or uh, hashtag heart failure. So at heart, A-S-U-T, or the hashtag heart failure. Ralph, sorry I rudely interrupted. Oh, Carry fine. on. Look, so, so these are the guidelines that we'll be talking about, and you can actually download them from the National Heart website. Um, and they're, so I'm very proud to have been involved in it. So we're talking about heart failure. And heart failure is, you know, it's, it's a terrible disease. And I think it's been unrecognised and undermanaged for quite some time. And you can see on the slide there's actually, you know, it does represent a large burden uh, for our patients and for our, our country. But I'd like to concentrate on the, the last two points, looking at the mortality. So after a, a you know, acute heart failure admission, one month later, you know, you think, well, 80% of people are surviving, you know, but that's still one in five that will be dead at one month. And then if you look at to one year, that's dropping down to almost, you know, up to 60%, so that's or 40% dying. I mean, that's a huge impact. If you think of our patients who have had heart failure for some time, um, you know, calling them chronic heart failure, again, you can see if you look at that mortality at five years, it's actually shocking. So we're talking about, you know, nearly half of our patients being dead within five years. Um, and there's, uh, the thing is that there's a lot that we can actually do about this. So, you know, so I was actually proud to be part of the guidelines because these are actually locally developed guidelines and, of course, these are now the most up-to-date evidence and there's a whole lot of recommendations that we go through. The expert working group you know, I, was, was actually, you know, a, a very esteemed group of people to be working with. Let me You've say, got to say that because oh, I'm sitting beside you. <laughs> we had wonderful cardiologists from all over Australia it was just the GPs that let you down. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and, and look, this is where I take uh, my hat off to, to the working group. We also had uh, myself as a, a GP. We had nurses as well as a clinical epidemiologist and um, a pharmacologist and general physician. So we had a wide-ranging representation, including a consumer representative. And I think that really added a lot of depth to the guidelines as we went through. The other thing about the guidelines... I don't want to harbour this too much, but we actually used a thing called the GRADE methodology. And I think the GRADE methodology is an easier way of understanding what it is that the panel were trying to say. So we come out with a recommendation. So that recommendation about whatever treatment it is will be weak or strong. So, you know, if we say that there's a strong recommendation, you know, you can take that on board. This is something that's really important that we should put in place. And then we also rate the quality of evidence, and that will go from, you know, high, moderate, low and very low. But it's the actual strength of the recommendation that I think is really important for uh, you to be looking at when you look at the guidelines. There's a whole lot of new things, and, of course, SGLT2s now are uh, inhibitors are becoming a, a, a bit of a, 
uh, a thing, as they a say. A thing, yes. It, it's certainly going around and it's going to have more and more information about that. Um, but, you know, certainly there'll be there's some information about the SGLT2 inhibitors. We have changed a little bit or, you know, moved around the edges for HEFREF, uh, which will come out. And that did cause some consternation. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail. There's a diagnostic algorithm, which I'll take you through in a minute. But there's also the treatment and titration um, algorithm, which will, you know, John will be talking about. And I think that's a, a really great output. It can really help, you know, uh, people working in primary care. And so just to, just to explain here, because you're using um, acronyms, so really talking about reduced ejection, ejection fraction, fraction or preserved erection, er, erection, sorry, ejection <laughs> fraction. It's too late in the day, sorry. And look, yes, I would encourage people to be switching, you know, their, their nomenclature to instead of heart failure or diastolic or systolic function, we should really be using heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, heart failure, preserved ejection fraction. And I know some of the software for our, um, our electronic records have already added them in so you can actually now code that as well. So I'm going to start off with this question about the ejection fraction below and above. So the key here is that heart failure is a clinical diagnosis, and I think that's really important. So it's a clinical diagnosis, and then we're using the ECHO to determine whether we think it's a reduced ejection fraction or preserved ejection fraction. So the change in the guideline is we've now shifted this, you know, ejection fraction of 40% and below into... Um, we've actually increased that to be 50% of blow and we're calling the whole group reduced ejection fraction. And, you know, and it makes sense putting it there because we do know that those people with heart failure with that ejection fraction between 40 and 50 do benefit and do behave more like reduced ejection fraction than preserved. So, and I think that's really, really important and certainly simplifies the way we manage patients because occasionally get an echo with someone who's got an ejection fraction of 45 and the guidelines up to date haven't been really clear on it. So I think this is a, a really great step that the panel took. And so that's sort of how we're now defining heart failure. So notice symptoms and signs are right up the top, clinical diagnosis. Then we're using an echo to determine whether it's reduced or preserved ejection fraction. And then that will lead us onto how we're going to, to manage the patients as we go along. Then the... Um, it's interesting, so the, the BNP and pro-BNP, which are, you know, a wonderful sort of test that you can actually use for helping us make that diagnosis of heart failure. Now, it's not PBS, uh, MBS subsidised, so it does cost uh, your patients, and it can be somewhere between, I've heard $50, certainly I've heard $80, but somewhere between $50 and $80. But it is, in fact, a really uh, good tool to use, and you can see it gets both a strong... Um, you know, recommendation with high quality of evidence. And I'll go through a little bit of that in a moment. But interesting, this is the, the echo is a really good example of where there's not a lot of evidence about the echo because there haven't been that many studies done because we were talking about that before, John. But it's such an important part of how we manage patients with heart failure. That's why it gets a strong recommendation. So this is sort of the, the diagnostic algorithm that we've put together at the panel. So we start off with, a, you know, history and examination. We do our initial assessment. And then, you know, if we think this person has got heart failure, you would then go straight to an echocardiogram. And then, like I said, that will tell you whether it's reduced or preserved ejection fraction, and then you would treat accordingly. If, you know, your diagnosis is uncertain, you may elect to do an echocardiogram, and that may sort of give extra weight into what you think is going on. But an alternative there is to use this serum BNP and pro-BNP. And, you know, if the patient has got, you know, high BNP and high pro or high pro BNP, then that's very suggestive of the fact that they have heart failure. And so then you would move down the heart failure pathway, do the echocardiogram and then treat them accordingly. And then, of course, there's a group of other people who will have, you know, shortness of breath, who end up not having heart failure, and then we would treat accordingly. Now, remember, the heart failure is a, a, a syndrome, um, so we always have to think about why has this patient got heart failure, 
you know, especially excluding things like coronary artery disease or other causes of heart failure. Um, and then, you know, thinking about why they've ended up here at that point in time. And so, again, we're going back onto this echocardiogram, it is, you know, one of the most single most important things that we can do because it really determines how we treat our patients. And again, the, P, the pro BNP and the um, BNP is there that can help. So sometimes if, if you're out rural, you haven't got ready access to an echo, then using the BNP or pro BNP can certainly help clarify what's going on in some of your patients. And then, of course, looking for the underlying cause, you know, looking for you know, ischemic heart disease as being a, a precipitant. Now, I, I do have a, a few things to say about this slide. These are sort of the red flags. Now, you know, I because these are sort of when you think about referring patients early, you know, into the hospital or into your cardiologist. Now, the first one is orthopnea. Now, I don't send all my patients with orthopnea to ED because this is one of the things that I look for on, when I'm managing my patients with heart failure. If they have increasing orthopnea, it means I have to intensify therapy. But certainly there are things like syncope or if they've got, you know, increasing angina, well, then I, I think, you know, that's a completely different ball game. And it's the same, you know, certainly in people who have hypotension. Now, again, uh, you know, having worked in the area for a while now, some of my cardiology um, colleagues will be happy with a, a blood pressure of 85. So when it comes to hypotension, I tend to look at the patient. If my patient's, you know, this time has got a blood pressure of 85, previously it was 90, but they're well and they're okay, they're not getting dizzy, uh, well, they may get a little bit dizzy when they stand up, but as long as it's not persisting, I'm then happy to wait and review them. Now, obviously, in the acute setting, new diagnosis, you know, again, that's very, very different. Um, but, and certainly, again, with the ECG, if it's a, something new like an infarct on an ECG, I don't think we'd have any problem about setting them off, but a lot of our patients will have had past infarcts. So if you've got an old ECG, hasn't changed, well, then, you know, I'm far less likely. Now, down the bottom there, you see that they've got an ejection fraction less than 40%. There are a whole lot of um, interventions that our cardiology colleagues can do in that particular group other than the medication. So it is important that they do get, um, you know, reviewed by a cardiologist. Um, but I just sort of tease those out a little bit because, um, yeah. So, John, troponins can be high just because you've got heart failure, can't they? Correct. And, uh, and we're not really suggesting that you should do a troponin on, on the patients, but if it happens to be elevated, admittedly now I think it's all a little different with the high sensitivity troponin, but if it happens to be elevated, it might be someone you'd consider referring earlier. Not necessarily to the ED. And the BNP, can the BNP... I mean, the BNP shows that your heart muscle is failing, doesn't it? Yeah, BNP... Can it not substitute for ejection fraction? It's not a substitute for ejection fraction. In fact, it can go up with your heart failure whether your ejection fraction is reduced or preserved, although it tends to go up less so in patients with a preserved ejection fraction. But it's a marker probably more of filling pressure, if you like, and, and cardiac wall stretch, but again, can go up with a number of other conditions as well. And so that's sort of it for me, so I'll hand over to John and let John take over. No, thank, thank you, Ralph. So now that we've now how to diagnose heart failure, we're going to come on to the management, although before doing that, uh, the first uh, slide just gives a bit of an update in terms of pharmacological approaches to the prevention of heart failure. Now, blood pressure and lipid lowering in appropriate patients, as well as ACE inhibitors in patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction, had been previously acknowledged in our guidelines. What, what is new in the 2018 guidelines is we've recognised the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 or SGLT2 inhibitors, which are recommended in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus associated with cardiovascular disease and insufficient glycemic control, despite standard first-line therapy, which generally would be metformin for us in Australia, to decrease the risk of cardiovascular events and decrease the risk of heart failure hospitalisation. And that's been shown in two clinical trials, uh, with epigaflozin in the Emperor Outcome Study and with canagaflozin in the CANVAS study. So that's a new recommendation. Now moving on to management. This is, you, you saw a diagnostic algorithm earlier. This is now a management algorithm. And, uh, and for those who are a little short-sighted like me, I'm just going to enlarge that. <laughs> 
And so you start up the top where you've made a diagnosis of heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. And we're focusing on that because that's mostly where our evidence currently lies in terms of being able to improve clinical outcomes in patients with heart failure. Now, if the patient, you start off with treating the patient with an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker, and we favour the ACE inhibitor with some you know, loop diuretic if they're congested. If they have persisting congestion having done that, we would then add a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. That is another word for aldosterone antagonist, and we often would favour spironolactone, say 12 and a half to 25 milligrams a day. And then when they're euvolemic, that is not congested, then we'd add a so-called heart failure beta blocker, and that again has come from previous guidelines, so that really hasn't changed. And here we're talking about bisoprolol or carvedilol or the long-acting version of metoprolol or nabivolol. Now, this was something which, uh, in fact, came from Ralph and, to, and, and the general practice feedback of wanting us to sort of split this up. And so if you have a patient who's congested, that would be the approach that one might take. But if they're reasonably euvolemic, having started them on an ACE inhibitor uh, and loop diuretic, then you might add in the heart fatty beta blocker next. And the reason you might do that is there's very good mortality evidence with the beta blockers. There is with the aldosterone antagonists as well, but that's generally the approach we might take. And I would say most of my patients, I'd be on the right-hand side of this algorithm. But loop diuretic isn't in here. No, so the loop diuretic is actually on the, on the right-hand side, if I go back, uh, of, the, um, of the algorithm. In fact, I'm not sure. I think there we go. Um, if you go back, it's on diuretics to treat congestions. They're all, all the right. way through. Okay. So I, you're, you're absolutely right, Norman. I've sort of skipped by that right, right. in that minor view. Little, 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 yeah. So you have, so the, anyway, at the end of all this, you end up with a so-called triple therapy combination of your patient being on an ACE inhibitor uh, or an angiotensin receptor blocker, a heart fatty beta blocker and an aldosterone antagonist, and we up-titrate the therapy. Now, again, something that Ralph was keen on was a bit of feedback as to how we do that, and we generally would favour up-titrating the beta blocker, provided the patient is not congested or if their heart rate, say, is less than 50 beats per minute. And that was something where, again, we were trying to provide a little bit of guidance as to what we favour. And, and we can go into more detail later as to why we might favour that approach. Having done that, then we would repeat the echocardiogram at three to six months. And the reason we do that is there are other treatment options which I'll come to shortly. And that's fairly new because that's yeah. certainly something that hasn't been recommended before. So I think that's a really important sort of take-home message to actually follow up with the ECHO yeah. to, add, to see how things are going. Absolutely. Now, uh, in terms of what informs that, well, there are a number of recommendations which I've listed on this slide. Again, these aren't really new, but recognising the evidence for ACE inhibitors, for the so-called heart fatty beta blockers and the aldosterone antagonists or mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and reducing mortality as well as hospitalisation or hospitalisation for heart failure. High level evidence, strong recommendations. Now we come back to our algorithm and then repeating the echo. If the patient then still has heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, say less than or equal to 40%, then this is where we kick into these other treatment options in our patients. And, uh, and first of all, an option there at the top is this, you know, this new class of drug I'll come to on the next slide, the angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor. Uh, but there are other options as well, including device therapies and, in appropriate patients, evabradine. Now, this is a new recommendation, these guidelines. So these are the ARNIs, if you like, or angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor. There's one at the moment we have available. It's Secubitril valsartan. And it is recommended as a replacement for an ACE inhibitor with at least a 36-hour washout window because there is, at least in theory, an increased risk of angioedema if you combine this with an ACE inhibitor. Or if the patient happens to be on an angiotensin receptor blocker, then you can replace the, a the ARB, will be replaced by the ARNI. And these are in patients who have heart failure with an ejection fraction of less than or equal to 40%, despite receiving maximally tolerated or target doses of this standard therapy being an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker with or without an aldosterone antagonist, and that's to reduce mortality and decrease hospitalisation and comes from a very large study, the Paradigm HF study, a strong recommendation. So I know, I know um, Ralph explained this, but you might need to explain it again why at the beginning we said 50% and now we're talking about 40% because that could be confusing. Yes, so this is the reason we're focusing here on 40% on is this is where the evidence is clearly strongest. Right. So these okay. are strong recommendations.
I will come to um, I'll come to the mildly reduced right. ejection fractions shortly, but this is where the evidence is clear, and this is you know most of these studies they enrol patients with EFs less than or equal to 35 to 40 percent. But I'll come back to the other group shortly. Now another option here is to use a vabradine. This was actually in our 2011 guidelines, so this is not new. But this is in patients, again, with a heart failure, in this case an EF less than or equal to 35%, who are in sinus rhythm, because this is a sinus node inhibitor, of at least 70 beats per minute, despite receiving standard therapy, and that's to reduce the combined endpoint of cardiovascular mortality or heart failure hospitalisation. A strong recommendation. Now, in Australia, the, guy, the TGA and the PBS access for this is actually based on a heart rate cutoff of 77 beats per minute. And, uh, and that's, in fact, where you see a mortality benefit as well in that group. But that's how we access the drug in Australia. So what you haven't spoken about, maybe you're coming to it, so just put me back in my box, we have, is rate control and where rate control fits into this. Yes, yeah, so our focus is, and a lot of the rate control, it's a great question, and this is, we're talking here, let's just start, start with sinus rhythm. Uh, you know, we would generally, we, we think a lot of the benefit, for example, of beta blockers probably does occur through that mechanism, although it's likely not just related to reducing the sinus rate. But we would generally aim to have a sinus rate of, say, below 60 or below beats per minute. Uh, but if a patient, despite pushing up their ACE inhibitor and beta blocker, has a sinus rate that's at least 70 beats per minute, that's where this drug was tested of Aberdeen. But, uh, but you're right, we aim to have the sinus rate you know, say, well, below 70, but in fact, often we're aiming for 50 or 60 beats per minute. And is, I'm sorry to take up time, but is, it, is the evidence here as simplistic as that you're clapping out the heart by letting it go too fast? Or is there anything more sophisticated than my gross description of it? Look, I mean, I wish I could tell you that I could give a more sophisticated description, but I can't. Uh, we, I mean, the, it's a, the, 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 the beta blockers are probably, as I say, partly working through that, but they're, they're reducing the adrenergic stress on the heart. Um, that may, there may be lots of other ways in which they work, yeah. but that's probably a reasonable way of thinking about it, and that's actually how I explain it to my patients. Right, clapping so, out. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe not quite the words, but very close. Yeah. Yes. Now, having said that, we, we might often aim for a heart rate of 50 to 60. In fact, when I treat patients, I'm actually, actually really just aiming to get them onto the target doses of these therapies. Right, but, but where the, that heart rate cutoff of 70, or based on TGA or PBAC, let's say 77, that's where we'd add in the Vabradine, because we hadn't achieved a sufficient rate control. Now, atrial fibrillation is actually a different question altogether, and there we're probably a little bit less strict about trying to get the heart rate too low. Now, in terms of other treatment options, diuretics, we don't have any evidence in terms of mortality reduction here, but these are used to treat congestion. They're very effective. We favour the loop diuretics, such as frosamide. So it's a strong recommendation, but very low quality of evidence. Another, th well, another recommendation we were keen to include, which wasn't in 2011, is that if you have a patient where you see what we call reverse remodelling, where their left ventricular ejection fraction improves on this standard therapy that I've talked about, we would generally continue that standard therapy, as in the ACE inhibitor, the beta blocker and the aldosterone antagonist. We probably would stop or reduce the loop diuretic unless we have a very clear reversible cause. And indeed, there's been some further support for this in a randomised control trial that was just presented a week ago at the American Heart Association, that if you stop these drugs, the patient's more likely to have a recurrence of their heart failure. Because very often, we haven't cured the heart failure, if you like, you can think of it more as a remission we continue the therapies. Strong recommendation. The evidence was low quality, although I probably would lift that now if I was looking at it again based on the study presented a week ago. Now, so the practice points, we aim for target doses of these drugs. However, we would generally prefer to have the patient on a bit of everything than all of one or the other. And so if the patient's blood pressure is borderline, we might not push up to the target dose of the ACE inhibitor if the patient's not congested because we're keen to get them on a good dose of beta blocker. For example, now back to your question, Norman, while most of the evidence has really been, well, it has been in patients with moderate to severely reduced left ventricular systolic function, EF less than or equal to 40%, post hoc analyses of, other, of, of studies, including patients with preserved ejection fraction, have suggested that the patients with EFs between 41 and 49% probably benefit in much the same way as patients where the EF is more, is more severely reduced. So it's, a, it's weaker evidence, it's a, it's a lower quality evidence, a weak recommendation, but it's new in our guidelines for that reason. 
Now, coming to preserved ejection fraction, we don't have much to say, certainly not in recommendations. Here you treat the congestion, you treat the comorbidities such as hypertension. There's a bit of evidence to suggest that low-dose spironolactone may be something that you should consider to reduce, in particular, heart failure hospitalisation that came from a large study called the TopCat study. I'm not going to talk to this table in the interest of time, but this is an evidence summary that's in the guidelines that sort of provides, I guess, if you like, one table, a summary of the, well, I think what we believe are the key recommendations that guide us in the management of patients with heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. In terms of non-pharmacological man management, we already had recognised the, the strong evidence for heart failure disease management, which involves heart failure nurses and other, uh, other healthcare staff, pharmacists, etc. Um, but we've, as a new recommendation, these guidelines have indicated that in patients who cannot access those programs face to face, that we should consider the multidisciplinary telemonitoring or telephone support programs. And indeed, since our guidelines, there's been a study from Germany showing a benefit with that approach. Nurse-led medication titration is also recommended in the guidelines, and this is based on a, uh, in fact, a Cochrane review that was undertaken looking at seven randomised controlled trials showing that not only with this approach do patients achieve higher doses of these neurohormonal antagonists, they also appear to have better outcomes, such as reduced hospitalisation. So that's made its way as a strong recommendation as well in patients who haven't achieved target doses of those therapies. We have given a recommendation for exercise as well, although I wouldn't say that's changed in any large way since 2011. And in terms of practice advice, we've recognised, particularly for the heart failure disease management programs, that one should focus on high-risk patients, such as those recently hospitalised with heart failure. So now I'll hand over to so Ingrid. Just before Sorry, you go, yes. you didn't mention salt and you didn't mention fluid restriction. Well, uh, well, we, we Are do Are you going mention, to mention that? No, I don't, no. We're not planning on it, no. Um, so the evidence there is pretty weak, even though we, we have it as part of our management of patients with heart failure, particularly when they're congested. Um, the SALT recommendation is, in fact, no different generally. We ended up to what we recommend in the general population. Uh, there is a randomised control trial looking at this question at the moment. There's even less, it's less clear what we should be doing on top of the comprehensive neurohormonal antagonist therapy that we give today. So, so it is there if patients are congested that we, in terms of salt and fluid recommend uh, um, restriction, but it's not a strong part of the guidelines. And daily weighing? Yes, it's there. that's part of the heart failure disease management and monitoring. Right. Absolutely. And look, what I'm going to jump here, one thing I'd love to, to stress is that, as you say, patients coming out of hospital with the nurse-led titration clinic. So certainly I've seen them implemented within the hospital system. Certainly we've been doing this now within general practice. And so for GPs who are actually very busy and having difficulty getting patients in to have their medication up titrated, we've actually been training our practice nurses to be able to take a lead in that. The evidence behind that nurse titration is fantastic and you get up to target doses much quicker and I think that's really important. What about um, loop diuretics? Because you can rapidly get to incredibly high doses mm -hmm. and there's some evidence of tachyphylaxis that you're, you're chasing your tail and you should be really very disciplined about low-dose loop diuretics so that you don't get into that problem. So I think if a patient's persistently congested, and we certainly do this in the hospital setting, we may use quite high doses, but what you have to remember and this is where the daily monitoring of weight is important as well, is to back off when the patient's not so congested. Now, there are some patients where they actually do need to have, you know, high doses long-term. Now, they're fortunately not a very large group of patients, but an important group. But, but the important point with loop diuretics is this backing off on the treatment when the patient's not congested, so adjusting therapy with, I guess you could say, up and down titration. And monitoring therapy with BMP or pro-BMP? It's, it's in the guidelines. Uh, the reason I haven't mentioned it is, in fact, there's been a large trial, a randomised controlled trial undertaken, which didn't achieve the primary endpoint of showing reduced death or hospitalisation. Mm. So that's the reason why it's, it's certainly discussed in the guidelines. It's an option there for patients who are difficult to manage. And, in fact, the evidence is a bit stronger in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. But in terms of the large-scale randomised control trial that was powered to look at morbidity and mortality, it didn't achieve its primary endpoint. There's a lot of reasons why, but I won't in the interest of time go into all the details. Sure. Ingrid, sorry to delay you. 
No problem. So these are all the comorbidities that are covered in the guidelines and you can really see what a difficult job it is treating patients with heart failure. Cardiologists haven't got a hope without GPs and without the multidisciplinary team behind them. We'll focus on just the four that are highlighted here, but if you, have, if you read no other section of the guidelines, then I would strongly recommend you check out the comorbidities section. So first of all, we've got atrial fibrillation. Just a reminder that there is an AF web, a webcast next week, so tune into that. The first recommendation is, of course, to determine the risk of stroke to guide the need for anticoagulation. And this is a strong recommendation with a high quality of evidence. The, the second is that there's a pharmacological therapy aiming for a resting ventricular rate of 60 to 100 should be considered if there's heart failure in association with AF and a rapid ventricular response rate. And that's a strong recommendation with a low quality of evidence. A new recommendation is for catheter ablation for AF. So that's either paroxysmal or persistent AF. So consider catheter ablation in patients with HEF-REF with an EF of less than or equal to 35% who present with recurrent symptomatic AF to decrease mortality and hospitalisation for heart failure. So that's a strong recommendation with moderate quality of evidence. It comes from one trial, which is the Castle AF trial, and it really challenges the AFFIRM trial that suggested that uh, rhythm control has no advantages over rate control, and it's clear that in heart failure, you're better off out of AF if you can get there even though ablation might give you a restricted left heart? So, I mean, it's a, I don't think we quite know that. Uh, I would say that the, the effects of ablation in terms of left atrial function is an is a area of debate, um, but I don't think we can say it leads to a restricted yeah. left heart in terms of, well, left... In, left the left interventional control. cardiologists watching are just going berserk <laughs> at me, but... <laughs> well, we'll move on to the next one then. So, the, some practice points regarding atrial fibrillation. So for AF rate control, beta blockers are your go-to drug. If you're in HEF-REF and you're struggling to get rate control, then you can add digoxin, but it doesn't have an effect during exercise. You can consider uh, diltiazem and verapamil in the setting of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction to control the ventricular rate in AF. However, these aren't to be used in HEF-REF because they're negatively inotropic. You can also consider oral, uh, oral amiodarone in patients with heart failure associated with AF to facilitate attainment and maintenance of sinus rhythm with or without electrical cardioversion to improve symptoms or to guide decisions regarding the need for more invasive approaches such as ablation. But presumably that's temporary. Well, you need to... There are significant side effects from amiodarone, so you need to make the decision with the risk and the benefits. There'll be occasional patients where you're on it long term. You try to use as low a dose as possible. You're absolutely right. Um, but these are patients where they really appear to be quite symptomatic. But they're also the ones that you might then be considering ablation as well. So it's a holding yeah. pattern. Yeah. 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 So the next, the next recommendation is regards, regarding sleep apnea and the use of adaptive servo ventilation. So adaptive servo ventilation is not recommended in patients with HEF-REF. Do you want to just explain what that is? I'll get to it in a second. Okay. <laughs> so in HEF-REF and predominant central sleep apnea because of an increased all-cause and cardiovascular mortality. So this came from one trial which had... Which, so it's a strong recommendation against with a moderate quality of evidence. So the message here for the GP is that if you have a patient with heart failure, then ask their partner, do they stop breathing at night? And if so, it's a red flag that the heart failure may be worse than you think it is. So go on and do a sleep study. And if the central sleep apnea is present, which is Shane Stokes breathing, it's a poor prognostic indicator. And it tells us that we may be looking at end-stage heart failure. So you should be referring the patient on for advanced therapies. It's a really stop and think message. What's clear is that we don't have good devices. Adaptive servo ventilation didn't help but we do have good treatments for heart failure and that's really what we should be focusing on under these circumstances. In the setting of obstructive sleep apnea, which is different than central sleep apnea, then you can give positive pressure ventilation to improve quality of life and to decrease sleepiness. But again, that's purely symptomatic treatment.
So the issue of anemia and iron deficiency, anemia is common, it's present in about one third of patients and iron deficiency is present in about 50% of patients. And it's due to altered absorption and metabolism of iron in a heart failure. So the first recommendation is that erythropoietin should not be used routinely for the treatment of anemia in patients with heart failure because there is an increased risk of thromboembolic adverse events. And this is a strong recommendation against with moderate quality of evidence. However, in patients with HEF-REF associated with persistent symptoms despite optimised therapy, then iron studies should be performed and if the patient is iron deficient, which is a ferritin of less than 100, or because it's an acute phase reactant, a ferritin of 100 to 300 with a transferrin saturation of less than 20%, then intravenous iron should be considered. But this is, the bottom line is this is to improve symptoms and quality of life, but there's no mortality benefit. And look, I'd just like to harp on that. The, that less than 100 mil, a microm, that's going to be something new for GPs in terms of considering people low in terms of ferritin. So, you know, we normally talk about being less than 30. So for heart failure patients, it's less than 100. Um, really important to get that message across. And now as GPs, we have access to a new formulation that we can now do in our rooms. And that's exactly. a really good thing. So... That's intravenous ferric carboxymaltose, and that's this formulation to be using because the randomised control studies were all with that formulation. It's easy to give in your rooms, as you said. In fact, it's funded for outpatient, not funded for inpatient, and that's an essential role for the GP. It's really important to remember as well that if iron deficiency is diagnosed, that you should consider in the back of your mind whether you need to do investigations for gastrointestinal pathology such as peptic ulcer disease and malignancy, especially if anemia is present, not just the iron deficiency. And after, this, after you go and uh, supplement the iron, it's important to recheck the iron after four months. So diabetes, in the interest of time, I'll just go through, through this quite quickly. The recommendation is not to use glitazones. This is a weak recommendation against. And the practice points are to maintain an HbA1c between 7 and 8, continue to use metformin as the first-line oral hypoglycemic, and SGLT2 inhibitors are preferred as the second-line oral hypoglycemic agents in patients with cardiovascular disease. At the moment, the trials indicate there's a signal for heart failure, but they're not powered to support this for a recommendation for heart failure. So the trials are ongoing at the moment, looking at SGLT2 inhibitors in patients specifically with heart failure, with and without diabetes, and that's an interesting one to watch this space. And what the about the recent years. suggestion of increased amputation rates? John, do you want to talk about that? So, I mean, that came from canvas with canagliflozin and hasn't been seen with ampagliflozin or dapagliflozin. In, the, in fact, the most recent study presented just a week ago. Um, so at the moment, we're not really sure how to put this all together and, uh, you know, it may not be a class effect, but it's a bit of a mystery. So and counting no. is no longer available in Australia anyway, so it's not so much of an issue for us. Yeah. Just speeding through the last ones, palliative care. Referral to palliative care should be considered in patients with advanced heart failure, and this is to alleviate end-stage symptoms, improve quality of life and decrease hospitalisation. A strong recommendation with high quality of evidence. Also, don't forget that if in a patient with an implantable cardioverter defibrillator or ICD, to undertake discussions concerning deactivation, and that should be between family, patient, cardiologist and GP. And patients should be encouraged to have an advanced care plan regardless of their clinical status and very soon after diagnosis. I'd like to acknowledge all the members of the working group, including in particular John Atherton, who was the chair. He did an amazing job. He did, didn't he? I was really impressed. We had such a great working group and... You know, had consensus driven and so well. Yeah, yeah. that was an excellent team. Really well. uh, these are the organisations that have endorsed the guidelines. The, publication, the publications are available free um, to download from Heart, Lung and Circulation and the executive summary in the Medical Journal of Australia. There are a number of resources available on the National Heart Foundation of Australia website that are all listed there and that includes algorithms and tables as separate documents if you need them. Uh, and we'll, that's we'll go to that. Just before we go to the case study, what about indications for implantable um, defibrillators? Yes, so they're definitely there. And in the interest of time, and given we thought the focus was probably going to be more in primary care, I did skip over it. 
uh, because there are certainly recommendations in that space. On that treatment algorithm, down the bottom where I talked about angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors, as well as avabradine, if you had a patient who's on the triple therapy combination with their ejection fraction still being persistently reduced with heart failure, in this case less than or equal to 35%, that is certainly where we consider device therapy in the form of implantable defibrillators to reduce the risk of sudden death. The evidence there is strongest if you have ischemic heart disease, so a strong recommendation there. If you have dilated cardiomyopathy, it's a weak recommendation, but still there. So we've still given the positive recommendation. And what about mitral rings? Mitral, that's a great question. Uh, we gave that a weak recommendation. This is patients with functional mitral regurgitation. Because the heart's large. Yes, we're, uh, and, uh, but there, has been, there have been two randomised controlled trials published since our guidelines. One was positive and the other one did not achieve its primary endpoint. So we might still say the evidence is a, still one that we could... Um, debate, but it, it's, it certainly has had a, a positive recommendation in the guidelines, even though we gave it a weak one. And a question here, and I'm not sure I understand this thing, is ACE inhibitors and lung cancer, what's the best response <laughs> to patients who raise this concern? <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so this comes from a cohort study in the UK where they looked at almost a million patients with newly um, treated hypertension or new, commenced on therapy, and they were specifically looking at ACE inhibitors, comparing that to other therapies. So when you compare patients who were started with ACE inhibitors as opposed to angiotensin receptor blockers, there was an increased risk of developing lung cancer over time. And there's a bit of a biological reason why that might be the case in terms of increased bradykinin and substance P. Now, what's, when we put that in perspective, the absolute risk increase in that study was 0.4 per 1,000. In other words, you'd need to treat two and a half or well, the number need to treat with 2,500 to cause one lung cancer over an average follow-up of six years. Now, if we look at what happens when we use ACE inhibitors in heart failure, the number needed to treat to prevent someone dying is 22 over three years. So the risk, the, benef the risk benefit... The risk benefit is way out of... You know, it yeah. certainly favours treatment. It's a debate for hypertension, um, but, you know, and really the signal wasn't seen until after five years of therapy anyway. But, uh, but I think we need to see that confirmed in another, you know, large study. Keep your questions and comments coming in, either via Twitter or using that bottom button on your screen. Let's go to our case study at the moment. We've got a 64-year-old man who comes to see a general practitioner, recent diagnosis of uh, heart failure. He was discharged from his hospital admission two months ago. His, uh, LV, uh, his uh, ventricular ejection fraction was 30% at diagnosis, normal coronary angiography. Um, his past medical history includes hypertension, he's on bisoprolol, perindopril and frusamide, and he's breathless on exertion, sleeps flat, though, but is mildly fatigued. His blood pressure is 110 on 65, heart rate 79, sinus rhythm, and he's euvolemic, meaning he's not congested, I assume. Ralph, he's your patient. Yeah, look, I, I think this is a great one to, to start off because he's been recently diagnosed, he's been in hospital... So my first thing that I do within my practice now is that in people who have been admitted to a hospital with heart failure, I like to see them within a week and earlier if I can because I like to, to eyeball them and actually see how they're going, what they understand and what they're actually doing and what sort of follow-up arrangements um, are actually underway. And then I can also... I'm, I'm lucky now because I've got my nurses trained up. So I'm lucky now that I can then um, put down a, a titration schedule to get... Um, his target doses of but medication step one is up. The, the cardiac service knows to get it back to you with a discharge summary. And that, <laughs> that is a challenge at times. I mean, we don't often get... Well, we, look, it's getting better. We, we do get a, a discharge summary a lot of the times, but um, most of your patients will come with a, a bag of things and, and you can sort of go through the bag and work out what it is that they're on. And then they will have an outpatient appointment. And usually the outpatient is about four or six weeks after discharge, which, look at the evidence, is far too long. And so I like to try and capture them and, and start um, increasing their, their medications. And then I like to write a letter to uh, the heart failure clinic because that's where they usually end up. And then usually because you've written a letter, you'll get a handwritten letter back. And then they'll say, right, you know, no, this is the, we're happy with this and what we want you is this, this and this. And then so you start doing that. And then they'll usually go back in another six to eight weeks to the heart failure clinic. And so between us, I, I, you can actually do some really good things. But I would have actually been tackling the bisoprolol well before the two months because I think that's really important. And we know it decreases sudden death. And, and a lot of these people, you know, will die. So if you get them on target doses quickly, 
um, you'll, you'll actually save lives. So how quickly do you... Up, it's a good question we've actually got uh, from the audience, is how quickly do you up-titrate? Well, for me, it's probably two to four weekly, depending on what they're like. So, I mean, every patient is different, but at, at the, the earliest I will do with two weeks, but usually it's three to four weeks by the time you sort out everything. So, and I'll usually, with the bisoprolol, I'll go up by 2.5 until I get them to 10. Um, and then, interestingly, because we are having this debate before about aldactone, see, I would have then probably used aldactone because he's still on fruzomide, but I've sort of started the titration schedule for bisoprolol and I was going to get that to maximum. Then I was going to add in the MRA. But, yeah. Yeah. I think I, it's also worth mentioning that if you are up titrating and you find that the patient isn't tolerating a dose that you pop back down, wait a couple more weeks and try it again. And you don't just give up on the up titration, you really persist with it. Right. OK. And triple therapy here? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> look, I think Ralph's absolutely right because he probably would have seen this patient earlier. So we'll say this was outside of Ralph's control and he saw them at two months. I mean, I think I often... Well, I, I agree I'd be pushing up the dose of bisoprolol. The sinus rate is 79. They're euvolemic. You've got room to move. You've got a little bit of blood pressure there. I possibly would even just think about putting them on 12-and-a-half aspirin and lactone at the same time. You might want to stagger that by a week, um, but I would at this stage. Um, this guy aim to get it, all these patients on triple therapy, and very often this will happen in hospital now, but not always. And again, just going back to your original comment, this is... A bit like the polypool idea, which is you give mm. lowest possible, lowest dose with effect to minimise side effects. Correct. Events. I think that's a fair way of putting it. In fact, we'd almost like a polypool, but just heart failure is so complicated because we do, it's a little bit of, adjusting bit of a recipe. But, but yes, no, that's a very good way of thinking of it. But, but, you know, with the key that we do want to push to maximum doses if we can. Mm. So we do want to get people up to a 10 milligram of bisoprol, 10 of perindoprol and 25 or 50 of aldactone if we can. That's correct. Because, you know, that's where the evidence is. And then, of course, once they're stable on that, you've got to start looking at, you know, where do the arnies fit in? So, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done. And, and I know the GP is going to groan, but this is where I think uh, care planning is really good because if, you, if you've got a, a nurse trained in heart failure, you're sitting down, you're actually putting in short-term goals that will carry the patient over the next three to six months. Then you've got your long-term goals around, you know, 12 months and two years, you know, when you're going to have to put in the echo, when are you going to refer them back to the heart failure service? And that all goes really nicely. And so then everyone has a document that they can read from. So I'd really push uh, care plans for people with heart failure. So I've got a question here from a cardiac rehabilitation nurse. Um, where does Entresto fit into this? So I think... You better explain what Entresto is. Oh, well... If just uh, for my benefit. So um, Entresto is the, the uh, trade name for Sucubitral Valsar. Oh, this is the... Correct, which name. is the angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor. So valsartan's the ARB bit and, and Secubitril is a prodrug that's converted into a neprilysin inhibitor. Um, so it, it decreases, so neprilysin breaks down a number of substances including natriuretic peptides. So the net effect is you increase the number of vasoactive substances including natriuretic peptide and that probably accounts for the beneficial effect compared to ACE inhibitors. I mean, getting back to this case study, um, I would be repeating the echo after doing this, and that's usually, as we mentioned in our pathway, at three to six months. And, uh, and then if the ejection, you know, if they still have heart failure with an EF less than equal to 40%, that's where you'd be using Secubitral Valsartan, and you'd be switching the ACE inhibitor to Secubitral Valsartan with that 36-hour window. So what if on the repeat echo, his ejection fraction is 50%? So I'll Pat yourself on your back and say a job well done. Yeah, well, that's, that's exactly right. And this is, again, why we have thought... So we'd stop be... everything. Yeah. No, no. No. <laughs> was... I think the question then becomes of do you continue to persist going for the target doses? And personally, I would continue to persist. Would you? What would you do, John? Look, if they, it depends. Uh, if, certainly if they had high blood pressure, I'd be pushing things up. But let's say their blood pressure is where it is there now. I would be aiming to get their beta blocker up to get that sinus rate lower. I, yes, that's correct. Um, but if their things are all borderline, they're well beta blocked, as in their sinus rate, let's just say it's 60 and their EF has come up to 60%, I'd be, or 50 or 60%, I'd be pretty happy with that. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, are, are, yeah. there, are there any predictors of reversibility of ejection fraction? There are, although at the end of the day we just treat everyone the same way. Yeah. We use this one size fits all and see what happens. You know, for example, patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy, the term I prefer, 
um, they're more likely, you're more likely to see this reverse remodelling than you might do in some with ischemic heart disease associated with reduced ejection fraction. Because so of fibrosis there? Yes, yes. Um, you have more fibrosis and, uh, I guess, less tissue viability in that setting. That's correct. Now, I mean, we haven't talked about the furosemide here now, and I'd be interested to see what you think, John. So I tend to mm. leave the furosemide, even though the uvolimic, while I'm bumping up the beta blocker. Mm. Once the beta block is stable and I'm looking at the ACE or adding in an MRI, then I'll tend to, as I bump one up, I'll drop the other down. Is that what you do? So, yeah, if they're uvolemic, I think that's reasonable, certainly for the ACE inhibitor. I get a little worried sometimes if the MRA or aldosterone antagonist, as you're initially studying them, if their potassium's on the higher side. I'm actually mm. like they're being a bit of loop diuretic. It might help, help oh, you there. Yes. But, but no, generally speaking, you're right. If the uvolemic, you'd be backing off on the loop diuretic. Um, let's say reduce it to 20 milligrams a day, the furosemide, um, to allow you to increase the other treatments. But the beta blocker, I would continue because there you're sort of a bit of worried about the potential of aggravating heart failure as you're up titrating. So, um, despite the self-congratulation a moment ago about the ejection fraction, <laughs> now I'm going to throw in that it hasn't improved. In yeah. fact, it's dropped a bit. What are you going to do? So, is this, uh, so I guess. Well, if it were me, yes, I would yeah. be look. I would be looking to. I'd, the first move I would do would be to increase the bisoprolol, and then mm. I would switch them across uh, this patient across to Entresto, the Sacubitril Valsartan, as well as uh, probably that would be my next step, and then I would bring in the MRA. But you would probably do the MRA. Look, if they weren't on it, uh, let's say we're talking, you know, you're doing your echo at three to six months and, you know, I think it's very reasonable to switch them over then and you can, get the, you can do the MRA, you, can, you might stagger it, but you could do it all at the same time because the benefit was there whether or not the patients were on an aldosterone antagonist. Yeah. So I think that's a reasonable thing to do. Very often we would have already started the aldosterone antagonist. Yeah. The other option here, of course, you're probably about to mention was a vabradine. I guess if the science Where are you about to mention the right? No, I was actually about to they mention ICD to... Okay. with an right. EF of 30%. Mm -hmm. That um, I would be looking to look at MRI to see whether there's scar there and um, consider an ICD. One thing we haven't mentioned, you know, again, if, if your patient's not doing well for whatever reason or you're not seeing the weight or the fluid come off, sometimes, you know, checking on their persistence with medication, work out what their fluids you know, are at home. And, you know, this is where I think sometimes the um, multidisciplinary teams where they'll sometimes do a home visit on patients can actually be very, very useful. Because, um, you know, heart failure can sometimes be incredibly isolating and the incidence of depression can be really, really high. And so, you know, it can be difficult for them to actually follow Motivate some themselves. of the things. Yes. And so I think having, you know, sometimes wrapping around a team that supports them can make a big difference as well. So you're all sort of hooked on these medication combinations. My understanding is if you do exercise properly, you can really reduce um, drug use. And nobody's talked about that. So it's there... a kind of token here. Yes. And so... there's a question here is how do, you do, how do you do the exercise bit properly? Do you get an exercise physiologist in? What do you do? Are you just going to go for a walk around the park with a dog? I mean, what do you do? So I would refer a patient like this to rehabilitation. There's, there's increasing evidence that cardiac rehabilitation has uh, improves outcomes for heart failure patients. So that would be in my first instance. Uh, as part of that, they teach, the, they teach them about self-management of heart failure, about the medication and about exercise. In terms of the best exercise um, program to the evidence for the exercise. It, the, in the first instance, it should be done undertaken with an exercise physiologist under cardiac rehabilitation to make sure it's done safely. Could you talk about the evidence about which is the best program? Well, I'd, I'd probably just refer people to Heart Online. It's assist, uh, it, it gives a good description of how one might set up a, an exercise training program. And yes, very often yeah, you'll be guided by exercise physiologists or physiotherapists. Um, but you know. You, they often would use a six-minute walk test and might do some other um, tests as well, depending on the patient's mobility, to guide them in terms of an exercise prescription. Now, that includes not just the face, you know, the sort of the gym component, if you like, the facility-based component, but a lot of the course is based on giving recommendations to, to guide the patient when they go home. Uh, I know they talk about Borg scale and, you know, having, I think it's uh, 9 to 13 in terms of the rating of perceived exertion. But for me, that's all a bit too hard. So I just think of it as, you know, if you're able to exercise but still hold a conversation and talk in full sentences, yes. that's what we're aiming for. So 
Yeah, heart and lung. I, I've not heard of them because yeah. yeah, sometimes the wait for these these cardiac rehab programs or heart failure programs long. can be quite long. So mm. that, that's that's a, a great tip. I hope. Yeah. yeah. And you've been sitting for weeks on yes, this train thing. Yes, I know. He hasn't mentioned it now. Really, you've got, to, you've got to be on television to actually get it. When would you think of an SGLT2 in this situation if he's not got diabetes? Would you think about it at all if you got, des would, or, if you got desperate? Moment. No, I think it's, I mean, that's exactly what clinical trials are looking at at the moment. But at the moment, no, it's uh, in patients with diabetes uh, in terms of obviously improving glucose control and there's also evidence... Uh, with this, uh, in patients with cardiovascular disease that there's a benefit in terms of reducing cardiovascular events as well as developing heart failure in patients who don't have heart failure. Do but in that clinical trial, some patients had heart failure. They seem to have similar benefits, but we just don't have enough evidence to say we should be doing that independent of treating their diabetes. Did you look at the evidence? There's a question here, a very good question about screening. I mean, did you look at the evidence of underdiagnosis of heart failure, the proportion of people with heart failure who are missed, and whether in certain categories of people there should be routine questioning by the GP? Look, I, I, that's a great question because um, a lot of our patients, in fact, may be symptomatic, but it's not until you actually really question them that they'll actually volunteer those symptoms. And, you know, certainly as your pa if, if you've had anyone who's had an infarct, as they age, you really want to have a good look at them to see if they are, in fact, developing heart failure with you know, very specific questions. Um, because if you get these people early, I think the impact that you can have is absolutely great rather than mm. waiting for them to get into trouble. Um, so yeah. so there are, are there diagnostic signs? You're talking about comorbidity. I mean, if you've got somebody with diabetes, are you wanting to probe for heart failure? I mean, what... Yeah, I, I would think so. Uh, so if I think the, the key is really that this is a 64-year-old man who's getting older. There are a number of comorbidities that you need to be watching for that you do need to treat carefully in this context of heart failure. So arthritis, you want to be avoiding the anti-inflammatories or minimising them and using alternatives if you can. Looking for COPD, if there's a smoking history, making sure that patients aren't taking the uh, uh, unnecessary beta-2 antagonists. Uh, looking at gout, and um, that's very common in the setting of heart failure, and the appropriate treatments for that to avoid the anti-inflammatories and keep the, the uric acid levels down low, as well as the, um, the issue of depression, which we have, have talked about. Uh, these are complex patients with, with multiple conditions that will pop up over the years, and you've really got to be looking out for all of them. And is gout, just, is gout a parallel condition, or does it affect the heart? So gout is, can be precipitated by the diuretics, so it's very commonly seen in the setting of acute mm -hmm. heart failure. It doesn't affect the heart failure per se, and treatment of the gout doesn't affect the prognosis of the heart failure. Just makes life more miserable. Yes, you just can't use the anti-inflammatories, because it's still one of the commonest reasons for people to end up in ED with heart failure is the use of anti-inflammatories. And, of course, with uh, neurofin being so widely available, a lot of people just don't realise. But I should, I should, I should add, Norm, we did talk about BMP screening in the sort of question you were mm -hmm. asking before. For example, in a patient with diabetes, uh, the trouble is, while there's some actual clinical trial evidence from a couple of randomised controlled trials, one in particular was positive, they're small studies. So I don't think we have enough evidence to advocate that as a routine strategy. But in terms of clinical evaluation and probably considering a 12-lead ECG in those patients is very reasonable. Um, a registered nurse, Sally, has asked a question. What level of side effects would you tolerate while up titrating and at what stage would you drop the doses back? I think what was what um, what we discussed earlier was that you'd be treating it the the side of the some the main side effect you're looking at is hypotension and renal impairment from up titrating the medications. I would be sacrificing some kidney function to get those medications oh, really? up. Yep, and I'd also be tolerating the a hypotension. As low as 90, I'd be pretty comfortable with, provided the patient wasn't falling over, wasn't dizzy, wasn't so, held back. So is the renal the function being affected by the loop diuretic? or? So the combination of the loop diuretic and the ACE inhibitor, so that you'll often get a bit of a drop. But that's reversible, isn't it? Correct. It's mostly reversible. So you can have a drop between 30 and 50%, and that's still OK if you're instituting an ACE inhibitor. Those patients don't do... Uh, it's a sign that there's the, the heart failure is quite advanced, there's some kidney impairment. It's a sign of a sicker patient, but the mortality benefits with those medications that have caused that renal drop is still there. So it's not... Even though it might be a little bit cardiotoxic, it doesn't overwhelm the effects of the drugs? A bit renal toxic, yeah. Yes. And, and look, certainly when I speak to my special, my cardiology colleagues, they always say, you know, 
drowning is a terrible way to die. Um, so, you know, sacrificing a little bit of renal function to keep people, you know, breathing well and stop them from drowning, I think is a good outcome. Well, thank you all very much indeed, but mostly thank you very much to you for uh, joining us in such vast numbers around the nation and a multidisciplinary uh, audience from nurses to general practitioners to cardiac rehab nurses to cardiologists. Um, thank you all very much uh, for joining us, but please join me in thanking Ralph, John and Ingrid. I'm Norman Swan. Do join us next week for our webcast on atrial fibrillation.